Okay, hi, hello, and good evening, everybody, or good morning, wherever you are. So welcome to this three-day night school, and we are quite happy, privileged to welcome you all to this three-day night school. Uh, three-day night school is much closer to, you know, Lama Khan, uh, because the conceptualization of night school uh, started right at the, you know, inception of Lama Khan itself, because we had a lengthy, in-depth, you know, night schools uh, on the subjects like uh, caste, caste in India, feminism, gender sensitivity, Marxist ideology, and so on. So we keep uh, doing night schools time and again. And this is the first occasion that we are doing night school uh, during the lockdown, and especially online format now. And uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this night school, we had a lot of you know, conversation that was happening for the last three months. So the whole uh, conceiving of this uh, planetary web of life has come because of being involved uh, with Radha and she curated the entire content. And she came up with this title as well as, you know, the, the duration of the uh, whole night school as well. So it's going to be three days, three consecutive days, I would call it. And uh, today she's also going to brief you about what is this planetary web of life. And uh, probably uh, those who have not seen some of the links that we have shared on our uh, website, as well as on our Facebook page, uh, please go through the content. Uh, she has given some suggested readings and that would help you to comprehend the information that's going to roll out today. And uh, apart from that, I think, uh, uh, she's going to tell you about the planetary web of life and then i will take the uh, opportunity and also i will take this honors to introduce uh, radha gopalan to you uh, she has become a very dear friend now uh, to us especially to me because we have been conversing you know, back and forth the time and again and for small things as well so she keeps on you know messaging me uh, about anything and everything and uh, it has always become a very wonderful you know, uh, you know sharing of information and uh, uh, to those who uh, do not know radha gopalan radha gopalan is a trained uh, you know environmental scientist and she holds a phd degree from iit bombay and she has over 20 years of experience as an environmental consultant and Radha has, uh, you know, uh, pursued her long-standing, abiding passion for education, and that's why uh, she has taken this leaps and bounds into you know, education. And she went to uh, Madanapalli at, at the Rishi Valley School, and she taught there for uh, eight years. And she taught her uh, sustainability and natural history, and uh, you know, to the high school students. And she was also deeply involved and engaged with the concept of food. So our early discussion was uh, to have a night school on food. Then she said that, you know, uh, merely food will not going to work out because uh, there are interconnected, inter interrelated things as such. And that's how this concept has come. And uh, uh, apart from that, uh, she is also a member of the Kudali uh, you know, Intergenerational Learning Center, Telangana and uh, uh, she is also a senior uh, course designer with Gen Wise, and uh, she works with the school children to strengthen the you know, uh, understanding of the interconnected of life on earth. She is also a visiting faculty at uh, Azim Premji University with the School of Development and a lead faculty uh, as an online you know, course on sustainability in the Indian context. Uh, she is also uh, one of the uh, editorial board members of their science magazine called I Wonder. And apart from that, uh, her uh, hobbies include that she is a very uh, staunch and avid yoga student practitioner, and uh, she is also uh, a teacher. Uh, I mean, in fact. Uh, she follows the tradition of BK Iyengars uh, for the last 20 years. So I think with those uh, few words, I would now like to you know, welcome formally uh, Dr. Radha Gopalan. And please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so very much, Radha, for this uh, night school. Thanks a lot, Nain. And uh, 
It's actually um, quite, I mean, it's a real pleasure to be, uh, and, and thanks to all of you for coming out uh, for this three-day uh, night school. So uh, a few disclaimers before I start. Uh, what I'm actually uh, hoping to do is sort of not, you know, me giving uh, some information or uh, sort of uh, talking about uh, talking about this, the whole idea of the planetary web of life in the sense of giving information on the issue. But really what I would like this to be is more of a dialogue where, um, you know, I probably share a few points to anchor our discussion and then after that we could all, um, you know, sort of collectively think about this and think this through a little bit. So, so that's, that's really what I would like to do and, and uh, Naeem had said that, you know, I would have about maybe 40 to 45 minutes to sort of share my thoughts and then uh, we'll have uh, questions. And uh, so what I will do is I'll use a set of slides because, um, uh, you know, one, uh, one has a tendency to ramble and I just want to make sure that I frame it in a, in a, in a sort of in a given context. And uh, so, so just, just for that, I'm going to use a few slides, and then I'll probably, uh, you know, take about 35 to 40 minutes, and then after that, it's uh, open to questions. So, um, I think... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Would, Would you like to say a few words about how the three days are going to be unfolded? Sure. Yeah. yeah, sure, Naeem. Um, so, as you can see, uh, you know, on the slide that you that are projected at the moment, um, you know, there are three paths to this whole dialogue or, uh, you know, what we we could call it a dialogue on the planetary web of life. Um, the first one is really to look at the web of life from a systems perspective, really take a systems view of what life is. That would be, so it's sort of uh, setting a framework um, today. And then tomorrow, um, I thought it might be useful for us to look at this framework in the context of our food systems. Uh, given that, you know, uh, our food systems have, of course, it's, it's a very critical part of our life, but given what we are facing today, uh, particularly with the pandemic, and its very close connection with what we've done to our food system, uh, I thought it would be useful for us to look at um, our food system in the context of this uh, web of life approach. And finally, um, on the last day, we will um, try and see how we can build resilience um, you know, for a, a future where uh, the planet, the Earth system, and the socio-ecological system that's a part of this Earth, how can we build resilience so that life can be sustained on the planet? So this is broadly how uh, the three days have been laid out. Um, it's flexible. There's a lot of, uh, I'm hoping to sort of let it evolve over the next three days. Like I said earlier, I have a set of slides which I will just use as sort of points for us to uh, engage in a dialogue. Um, so Naeem, I have about uh, 40 minutes, so it's about 7.15. Then we will open it up for a dialogue. So it's about 7.15, I think I'll, I'll probably stop by about uh, 7.50 or maybe before that even. Okay, so let's get started on um, today's discussion. Right, so now the first thing that I want to start off with is, um, I'd like us to sort of look at um, you know, various events uh, that have been unfolding around us for a while. And I'm just going to go back maybe about five, six years. Um, so for example, in India, we're looking at um, you know the Chennai floods in December 2015, um, Delhi, the smog of 2017, and successive years as well. And the floods in Kerala in 2018, August. And then, of course, India uh, sort of, uh, you know, this burden of malnutrition, which is the triple burden, where, where at, on the one hand, we have starvation, wasting, hunger, and on the other hand, we have obesity. And then this very insidious problem of micronutrient deficiency, which is, which is really one of the most significant issues uh, that the country is facing. And then, of course, there was the Kisan March um, in March of 2018. So there are all of these events. There is a relationship. There is a causality that has been attributed. So now let's sort of look at some of the, um, you know, the, what, what has been identified as causality. Okay. 
So we keep hearing about how uh, you know global warming induced climate change is causing um, sort of extremely uh, complex weather patterns, and so therefore extreme weather events. So that's one reason that's been attributed to some of these events, particularly the floods. And then we also there is also a reclamation of coastal areas that's been ha happening because of the rampant uh, development model or the growth model that we sort of uh, adopted. Uh, so that is happening in order to facilitate uh, this growth and development. We also have construction of river floodplains, which has been identified as a cause of all the Chennai floods. The triple burden of malnutrition, its relationship with the agrarian crisis, and with the industrial food system. There's a lot that's been written about this relationship. And then, of course, when we talk about uh, the smog in Delhi, or even any farm metros, air pollution is a big part of the problem, is what we've been discussing, with, uh, what has been out there in the media as well. And of course, a lot of smaller reasons have been attributed to the smog, particularly in Delhi. There's stubble burning in agri agricultural stubble burning in Punjab and Haryana, uh, firecrackers in, uh, during Diwali, and the regular emissions, construction dust, waste burning, etc., etc. So there's a whole bunch of um, you know sort of causes that have been attributed to the smog as have been, uh, you know, the list of sort of uh, causes that I've just put down there uh, seem to describe uh, some, all of the other events, some of the other events that, uh, that I was just talking about earlier. So the agrarian crisis is at the heart of the Kisan March. Now, uh, we look at some more uh, events like these and uh, again sort of look at the causality that has been attributed uh, to many of these events. So, so let's, let's take the Darfur crisis, uh, right, in Sudan, uh, or the conflict in Syria, and, and just the overall deepening inequalities all over the world. And then more, over time, actually, historically, we've had epidemics and pandemics. And what is the causality? What are the relationships to many of the other events that are happening at a planetary level or at a country level or at a national level? So again, global warming induced climate change has been um, Sort of put out there as a cause for many of the events that we observe, many of the phenomena that we observe. Um, the Darfur crisis, um, you know, people have talked about how religious fundamentalism was at the heart of the Darfur crisis. And of course, economic growth has been uh, sort of um, a big uh, causal agent for many of these things. The issue of enclosures, right? I mean, you know, where, where land, water, resources, um, both uh, physical resources as well as virtual resources, right? So the whole philosophy of enclosures, right? And also the industrial food systems all over again. So we keep reading, uh, you know, both scientific publications, non-scientific publications, and popular media. We keep seeing various causes attributed to various events. And they sort of looked at in uh, almost as discrete events, okay? So I've, I've listed a bunch of crises. I've talked about the Dartmouth crisis, the agrarian crisis in India, the conflict in Syria. So if we look at all of them, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is that these are not separate crises, right? They have emerged or they have happened because of, fundamentally because of the change in our relationship with nature. or and, and, and also because we attribute this, this kind of a binary, right? that you're human, you have nature. So we keep talking about how the human nature relationship has changed. And even in, even in discussing this from an ecological perspective, we still talk about them as two entities, human society, human beings, and nature. So I want to just put that point out there. Now, what has been the dominant response to many of these causes that uh, you know that I've sort of listed in the last couple of slides? So, if we look at global warming-induced climate change, which uh, we all know, we are very aware, is one of the one of the most uh, daunting uh, planetary crises that we're experiencing. 
So what is the dominant response? The dominant response is largely technology based. So you have you know, geoengineering solutions, um, renewable technologies, uh, and then from a biodiversity or from the point of view of absorbing some of that carbon dioxide, which is in excess in the atmosphere, it's about plantations or creating plantations. So these are the kind of responses that are by and large that we put out there. And it, when it comes to extreme weather events, such as floods, we're talking about you know, upgrading disaster management systems. We have, again, there are a whole host of technological solutions or technological uh, you know, technologies that we put out there in the form of smart apps, largely engineering fixes. Um, again, some engineering fixes, such as you know, desilting of water bodies would actually reduce floods. So most of these are um, strongly technology-based, right? And even when it comes to something like air pollution, and I've just taken a few examples here, just for us to get thinking about how we are approaching these issues. Right? So we, particularly in the case of Delhi, it was you know, largely emergency measures, and we seem to be going from one emergency to another. So we had the audible traffic management, moratorium on construction, ban on firecrackers, and things like you know, in order to shred all the crop residues, you, you know, there was an introduction of happy cedar. So again, these were very specific uh, firefighting emergency measures to deal with the immediacy of the air pollution. When it comes to things like conflict, okay, whether it is the Syrian conflict or whether it is threats to biodiversity, whether it is human-animal conflict or whether it is a conflict um, at the level of a nation where it is one, one, um, you know, one country or within the country, different communities conflicting with each other. In both of these cases, what has been the dominant response? It's been militarized solutions. So for, for military, so when it, when it is about a conflict within or between nations, then it is military solutions. If there are threats to biodiversity, there is militarized conservation, right, or the national parks, and particularly and this is very, very dominant, of course, we see it both in India as well as in various countries in Africa, right? Where the military is called in to enclose, to fence, to prevent some and to allow some, yeah? And of course, the issues of deepening inequalities, epidemics, pandemics, what has been the dominant response? It's always been the public becoming the private, right? And uh, I was talking about enclosures earlier. It's about closing from some and closing against some. Right? Closing for some and closing against some. And the other, uh, other big thing, which we're also seeing now in the context of uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, the pandemic epidemic situation, they, these are, uh, the responses are centralized and they are open, right? So we typically head, heading, you know, we typically sort of heading towards, or already are, uh, a deeply surveillance state where, again, we, we go back to the technological uh, aspects of it, you know, through smart apps, through uh, which you have to have on your uh, machine in order to be able to cross borders. So the surveillance state phenomenon, right? And then the closing of the borders, uh, protecting capital, right? And also, uh, and even, and in the case of the human-animal conflict is about culling animals. So there is a certain, uh, there is a certain uh, centralized response. And uh, I just want to sort of spend a couple of minutes on the culling animals. And the reason I put it under this is because these kind of uh, suggestions or these kind of uh, actions are driven from a central, uh, from, uh, from, from, a, from a central government. Let's say, for example, in the case of culling animals, it comes from the Ministry of Environment and Forest, for example. So we're looking at these kind of one-size-fits-all sort of solutions, right? It's, it's not about context-specific responses. And then, of course, there is medical intervention, which brings in big pharma uh, and the big battle that that uh, is ongoing. And, has, and we've always had this issue of open source versus private patent protection as a response to pandemics or epidemics, whether it is HIV or whether it is SARS-CoV-2. So these, these, have, these have really been the dominant responses to anything, any phenomenon, any event that has unfolded uh, in the world. 
So, uh, just to put this together, you know, what has been the nature of the response, right? The nature of the response is we are constantly treating the sector, right? We're also uh, firefighting, we're being reactive, uh, whether it is against disease or whether it is against social uh, inequality, whether there is, whether, there, whether, whether we are dissenting against something or whether there is a disease, right? The response is always reactive and firefighting. Whether it's a natural, uh, whether, whether it's an event that, that is impacting natural systems or whether it's an event that's impacting social systems, right? This is the kind of response. Um, the other thing that is interesting in the way we sort of respond to is we, we have this problems and solutions approach, right? You identify the problem and then we look for a solution. And invariably, technology is the solution to so, so if we were to look at all of the problems or, or, or the events that I had sort of listed earlier, for ev everything is looked at, I mean, even the whole issue of uh, global warming and used climate change. Apart from that, but the problem is the climate change, and we're looking for solutions, right? And, and by and large, technological solutions, whether it is uh, in the form of uh, renewable energy, renewable technologies, or whether it is in the form of uh, you know, biological responses, such as afforestation. And also, of course, another thing about the nature of our response is we're always looking for models, you know. Say, for example, in the case of, you know, COVID-19, oh, Kerala did a good job in, in India, right? So can we apply the Kerala model to other places? So we're always looking at models. We're looking to scale up these models. We're looking at replicating these models. And it is, uh, it, it is again about, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it again comes back to this whole centralized and this one size fits all. And if we found a solution to something, then it must be applicable somewhere else. And, and how can we apply it? So a lot of our resources, a lot of our energy is uh, expended in, in this kind of an approach. So really, the metaphor that I always think about is, you know, we're, it's, it's sort of we're missing the forest for the trees, and and, and that's that's where we that's where we are at today, um, in a in a sort of a, that's kind of the dominant situation today, I would say, right? So um, I thought let's you know let's take a few minutes to look at you know can we understand the forest through the trees, okay? So like say, for example, if we were to look at the whole issue of say, zoonosis, which is, which is what we are facing today, which is the transfer of disease from animals to human beings, right? whether it was SARS or whether it was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or H1N1, Ebola, Nipah, then the uh, Kaisenot forest disease, um, in which, which was um, sort of which, which really had impacted Kerala and Karnataka and the border areas quite a bit in the western part region. Or whether it is COVID-19, right? All of these are zoonoses, right? And what is, and, and if we want to really sort of, you know, move the cobweb away and really look at what the issue there is, it is about industrial food systems, right? It is about habitat loss. And Habitat loss is identified as the immediate sort of a cause, right? Because we're clearing forests, because we're clearing uh, vegetation, because we're clearing habitats, as a result of that, there is a jumping of the virus from the animal, uh, from the, from the animal system to the human system, right? But why are we clearing this? Why, why is this habitat, habitat loss happening? Why are we clearing these forests, right? Or why are we clearing this vegetation? Or why are we clearing these ecosystems? We're doing it because our food system is a very strongly industrial food system. So in order to accommodate that industrial food system, we are we are sort of engaged in this whole process of habitat loss, which is then resulting in the manifestation of zoonosis. If we want to then look at global warming and this climate change, right? if you look at the history of energy and we look at human civilization, I mean, there's this, there's such a close, uh, it's, it's sort of inextricably linked, right? The way we, the way energy, the way we use energy has evolved uh, over over the time of human civilization. 
decision. It's really about you know roti kapda and makan, right? And and, and more than more than that, but it is really about how how we feed ourselves, how we clothe ourselves, how we live, and then of course how we recreate and engage and uh, you know entertain and so on and so forth. I mean, just the whole human existence, right? So when we talk about global warming induced climate change, I mean to to sort of just relegate it. To, uh, to to a single cause, or to, or to sort of just look at it uh, myopically in a sense, without putting it, placing it in the context of how we as a civilization as have evolved, and, and and without sort of tracing how we've been using energy and how that has incrementally and and, and later exponentially impacted uh, the levels of carbon dioxide and therefore average surface temperature in the Earth. So it's so, so it's so important for us to really sort of get to the root of the issue here. Again, we keep talking about mass extinction, and we relate that to, to uh, global warming and this climate change, right? And then we have new new sort of terms coined: the age of Anthropocene. Right? So what is this age of Anthropocene? Right? And and I find it quite remarkable that that the human uh, mind is so interesting. That um, you know, at a planetary level, and we talk about epochs and eras, and 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 we occupy such a small, a small sort of moment in time of uh, of of the planet's existence, and we now call this the age of Anthropocene, right? So there is there has been a lot of discussion, uh, both in scientific publications and in uh, uh, you know in sort of uh, non-scientific discussions as well about the. About the legitimacy of using uh, this term Anthropocene, right? So now, when we talk about the age of Anthropocene, what is it characterized by? It is characterized by consumption. So, so we really need to get to the root of the issue and, and understand that it is that there is a relationship between consumption and mass extinction, between consumption, between the way we live, the way we use energy. And uh, global warming and this climate change relationship between all of this and the disease and the pandemics that we experience, and then of course we have uh, what is termed as the success story, which was the ozone layer depletion, right? Where um, you know there was global action where where a lot of countries came together um, and um, successfully. Um, actually patched up the uh, hole that was created in the ozone layer as a result of the use of a lot of chlorofluorocarbons, refrigerants, and fire ext and, and uh, 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 material that goes into fire extinguishers, etc. So we had said that was a success story because we managed to reduce the hole over the uh, you know the, the, the hole in the ozone layer. However, periodically. And, and, and even quite recently, recently we've had instances where, where the concentrate, where the stripping of the ozone layer actually went up again, right? So the thing, thing is that the material that goes into the the way, the way we've sort of so been looking at all of these phenomena, we've managed to reduce, we've sort of been looking at them as discrete events, which are problems and for which we need to find solutions, right? So now the question then is, who should respond? Who responds? How do we respond, right, to all of these phenomena that have been unfolding around us for a long period of time? So we have several players that we talk about always. The state must respond this way, but this is a market-created phenomenon, or this is how the market should respond, or this is how this this is how we need to reshape markets, right? Then of course there's people and society, and then we place nature. Right, we place nature also as an actor in this whole state. Right. So then I keep, I mean, then I come to these questions that we have to ask ourselves. Right. Are these issues, you know, where do you categorize these issues? Are they ecological? Are they economic? Social, cultural, political. I mean, how do you categorize all of the issues that we've talked about so far and that we've been experiencing? Yeah. And also, how do we know what these issues are? And then maybe they're all of the above, or maybe they're not. Right? So how do we define these issues? And who should respond to these issues? And how should we respond to these issues? Right? Is it that there are specific actors who respond to specific issues? Or is it, or is there some other way that we should be responding? So now when we come to 
to uh, you know looking at and now I'm sort of moving away from the whole issue of causality and relationships and, and all of that to response. So, so, so what I'm sort of putting forth there for our discussion is that let's begin to now move away from problems and solutions to understanding an issue and understanding response. Right? Really, that, that's, that's where we are now. So there's a bit of a shift in uh, what I've been sharing with you. So now all of these, uh, um, you know, the, the, the crises and the conflict and all of that that we've talked about, you know, they're, they're not sudden events that have just emerged, right? Uh, we need to really begin to see them as processes, right? In a certain context. And again, we, the, the context is not a discrete context, right? It's a social, ecological, economic context. And so we really need to begin to understand these relationships. And so. What I'm putting forth now for us to discuss is that can we look at this, can we take an ecosystems approach? Can we look at this as a, can we look at life as a system? Yeah. So that's sort of, that's, that's, that's where we sort of, we're sort of going at this point. So one thing, uh, so th there, are, there are numerous, uh, you know, there are numerous ways of looking at um, life as a system. Uh, but one um, sort of approach uh, that Richard Capra and, uh, and a bunch of other scientists have been talking about for quite a while, which I found very interesting and which I have used uh, a fair bit in uh, discussions uh, both with children and with uh, adults, is for us to really think about this idea of nested systems where we as individuals are, you know, within a household, within an economics, which is within a larger economic system, social system, ecological system, and then the earth system. And then, of course, you know, one could even definitely keep expanding um, towards the universe as well. But for our discussions and for the purposes of our thinking, if we were to sort of look at, and since, since our discussion is about the planetary web, um, you know, we were to stay with the Earth system. So if we were to look at this as this idea of nested systems, right? And within these nested systems, if we were to say that really life is about how we, uh, it, it's about this network uh, of relationships that exists between these various systems and within each of these systems. Okay, if we were to think about it like that. If we were also to look at it in the form of patterns and organizations, right? If we were to look at, if, you look, if we were to look at, and, and we're drawing from this whole idea of the ecosystem, we're drawing from this whole idea of the natural system of how it exists, right? Where in nature, we, in natural systems and in nature, we, we are constantly seeing patterns. We're seeing rhythms and cycles, right from very simple a diurnal cycle to much more detailed cycling of elements, cycling of material, the flow of energy, the flow of nutrients, the rhythms of life, you know, whether it's fruiting, flowering of plants, whether it is migration of birds, whether it is um, hibernation or estivation of animals, whether it's responses of, the, of that kind to changes in the environment around. It, it, it's, it's all about these uh, networks of relationships with cycles and rhythms and fluxes built in. And over and above all of this, we also have a whole, the, 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 the way uh, natural systems respond to change is through this whole process of feedback loops. You know, when there is a change, when, when there is a change in a, in a system, there is a response, and that leads to a, a different condition of the system, which leads to another change. And then the response is in response, and, 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 then, and, and whatever change happens after that is in response to that change. So there is this whole idea of, um, you know, and none of this, I mean, none of what I'm saying is, is new at all, of course, because I know a lot of you are familiar with all of these. But what I'm putting, putting out there is for us to sort of think about the way, um, you know, the, uh, to, to think about the, the events that are happening around us through these, through this understanding of um, natural systems where we have these networks of relationships and patterns and rhythms and cycles. And there's also a whole bunch of hidden connections that we, we don't understand. And these emerge periodically when uh, when an event unfolds itself in the world, like for example, uh, the most recent one, 
which is the pandemic. And there are a whole bunch of connections that are now emerging, whether it's in the cause or whether it's in the response, right? The way we respond leads to changes which were never fathomed. Right? And of course, like I said earlier, there are interdependencies both within and across systems. So now I'm just going to quickly um, sort of, uh, I, I know these are very sort of, uh, what, should, what do I call it? Uh, there's not much clarity in these figures, but the figures are being used not so much for us to go into the details of the figures, but to sort of say that we are all familiar with these figures. We've seen it in our science textbooks. You know, we're taught about uh, natural cycles. We're taught about, we're taught about the carbon cycle, the, uh, you know, the nit nitrogen cycle, the sulfur cycle, phosphorus cycle, and we're taught about them as separate cycles, and we draw them in our, in our notebooks and textbooks, and children study them day in and day out as part of ecology or biology. We also know about you know, food webs and the intricate connections between uh, in and, and each ecosystem having its own set of intricate connections and, and complex relationships of food. And then there's this really lovely picture that uh, that appealed to me tremendously, which is which is the one of the wood wide web, which is the more recent understanding of how trees communicate through a network of fungi in the you know uh, in the soil. And, and how these mycorrhiza, which is the network of fungi, how they communicate, how, how the chemical communication happens between uh, between trees, and which we are increasingly beginning to, understand, beginning to understand. And this is what I was talking about when I said hidden connections. So there's a constant unfolding of these hidden connections of natural systems that we are that we are learning about. They always existed, but you know, human human intelligence is now slowly beginning to understand some of this. So it's it's so there is this absolutely rich and complex relationship that exists there. Now most of the time when we study these cycles and when we study them in school as biochemical cycles or in university, we study them as discrete cycles, right? Like I was saying earlier. But if you were to really take even one phenomenon, right, like the global warming induced climate change, if you were to just take that one and this is a very simplistic representation. I mean, we're talking about the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. And both of these are strongly interrelated, right? But we never really study them in, in, in this manner in, uh, at a school level or, or even often at a university level. And often, of course, it, it completely uh, sort of steps away from our uh, um, sort of uh, you know, even even our consciousness at, at one level as we start uh, moving moving into higher education often. So here, for example, you know, when we're talking about uh, global warming and we're talking about climate change, so when you have land use change, you have fossil fuel burning, it is impacting the carbon cycle, but it's also impacting the nitrogen cycle. It's changing the balance of carbon and nitrogen. And there is an internal interrelationship between the two, which is so important for our food systems which is so important for life on Earth, this interrelationship, right? And what is very interesting is um, that in, even 1997, when studies were done by Vichusek and his team, it was, it was very clear that by 2030, the amount of nitrogen that is, that, that human activities, okay, that whole nitrogen cycle, the amount of nitrogen that's going to be fixed by human activities will exceed that fixed by microbial processes. So what we're doing is this balance of nitrogen that's been maintained by the cycling. So cycling itself denotes a certain kind of balance that's maintained, right? So when, uh, when we begin to interrupt the flows, when we begin to change these flows and we begin to interrupt these cycles, and we begin as, as human, and human activities begin to influence these cycles, there is a problem. And we see a manifestation of that problem in the form of climate change or the innumerable other changes that we're experiencing on the planet. So these are again those connections that we were talking about earlier. So going forward, so one of the things that um, that is being suggested for our discussion is, you know, can we can we sort of look at life as a web of network relationships? And that if we understand that life is this web of network relationships, which is in cycles and rhythms and patterns with um, interrelationships across and within systems and subsystems, then 
that allows us to think about how do we bring about resilience or how do we maintain resilience, right? Can we repair the tear in the web yeah, without creating another tear? How do we do that, right? And also, like I said earlier, can we see changes as conditions and responses, but rather than as problems and solutions, which drives a very uh, myopic and a very one-dimensional sort of a approach to really understanding something so complex, right? And this is where I'm sort of going to stop for our discussion and questions, etc. But I just want to put it out there that um, you know tomorrow's session we we'll look at the food web, our, our, our food system in the context of these relationships and the systems. And I thought this would be a good point, a good point for us to have a discussion where um, you know the ecologist and biologist Richard Levins and uh, Levins in both um, says this so well in in, in the book uh, the Dialectical Biologist for that, you know, the world is constantly in motion, right? The constants become variables, causes become effects, and systems develop, destroying the conditions that gave rise to them. So it's really, um, you know, so important for us to think about, and I, and, I, and I look at this statement, and every time I look at this statement, I think there is so much in this for us to sort of understand and um, really, um, sort of really begin to go a little deeper into this whole uh, system of relationships and how this change uh, that uh, what we see as discrete events and as problems and solutions are actually so much more complex. So I'm actually going to stop right here and I'm going to come out of the presenting mode because I don't think we need slides anymore. And uh, Naim, how do you want to do this? Do you want to sort of um, um, do the questions or... Uh, Right. I mean, the whole idea behind Night School is to have a dialogue and okay. in-depth analysis. Right. Since you have already, you know, uh, set the tone, yeah. I think the ball can be rolling now. Uh, mm -hmm. There are people who have actually uh, put up, I think uh, Devika has, you know, uh, put a question in the chat box. Yeah. Um, so you can uh, yeah, respond. I think sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so, what is the extent of da damage? So, Devika, you're saying, what is the extent of damage that human activities has caused to the ecological balance? Can you share the percentage? Um, I can actually share some, uh, you know, I can share references that you, know, you can go through because when we talk about the damage that human activities has caused, there is, there is, some, there is some really good research that has, uh, that has been done. But again, remember, most of these are estimates, okay, and uh, most of them are outputs of models. And uh, when we talk about the damage that human activities has uh, caused, now ecological balance is such a vast thing, right? And um, here I'd like to sort of uh, get us to look at, you know, there's this very interesting uh, model that um, Rockstrom and his team um, from Sweden have put out, which they call uh, the planetary boundaries. Uh, with, um, and, and in those planetary boundaries, there are very specific uh, uh, parameters that they've put out there, which, or which includes, of course, biodiversity, which includes the nitrogen balance, which includes climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, there's a, so I can appoint you to that reference because that would be a really good reference for you to um, get a sense of it, get 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 an understanding of what what we mean by uh, you know ecological balance because it's such a loaded word, ecological balance. So, yeah, but I will share that with you for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, I can sort of maybe put it out tomorrow as well. Yeah. So, yeah, people, please feel free to, um, you know, it's a dialogue. I mean, I I just put things out there for us to discuss. So. They are still feeling that they are in school where the teacher only tells and the people will listen to it. But children will oh, no. only no, no, we, We've got a bunch of people who are not at that point in life, I know. <laughs> So it'd be nice to uh, have a conversation. Yeah. So, uh, could you just highlight about you know the system approach has always oh, okay. failed. Okay, so we've got a, we've got a bunch of okay. So um, we've got one where uh, Vidan is that Vidan? Yeah. A lot of nature forests have been lost. How many real forests are left? Countries are foresting commercial trees. What's the impact? Okay, that's 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 interesting. Um, so yes, a lot, a lot of native. Now, now again, you know, this definition of forest is very tricky, right? So, what do we mean by native forests? Are they really, um, 
any native forest. But but it, but when we talk about forests, right? We're talking about an ecosystem. Okay, so it's very uh, so it's very difficult to say how many real forests are. Left. Now, for example, even something like the Amazon, or when you look at the Western Ghats, or when you look at Southeast Asia, um, there are a lot of I mean, there are very rich, biodiverse forest ecosystems there, right? There are, but it's very difficult to, it's, it's really very difficult at this point to say um, how many of them are native forests because a lot, unfortunately, the human uh, human ability to navigate, um, you know, the remotest corners of the earth has meant that not just today, but even indigenous communities has meant that there are a lot of um, uh, forest ecosystems or forests where human beings have gone, right? Now, um, having said that, um, countries are foresting commercial trees. Now, now, that's a very interesting point because today, one of the there is this whole uh, you know bond plan that is being put out there, saying that you know we if we were to just replace uh, you know so what if we're clearing forests for the you know cultivation of uh, food, right? So what if we're clearing forests for uh, fodder for cattle, right? We can always grow trees. Like for, for example, the whole uh, carbon, uh, you know, carbon market, carbon trading that was happening um, around climate change uh, is built around this thing that. So what if we clear forests? We can always plant them, but you can't because you cannot recreate that ecosystem. Those interconnections that I was talking about. Say, for example, let me give you the example of trees which are communicating through uh, mycorrhiza, through fungi in their roots, right? So, so you have that relationship which you cannot um, recreate. So you really cannot recreate that forest ecosystem, the way it absorbs carbon dioxide, um, the lives that it supports. Um, so you cannot recreate that. So therefore, so the biggest, the big impact of clearing and, and foresting commercial trees is that you have destroyed a large number of ecosystems, which means that you are, you are impacting very fundamental parameters that control and regulate life on Earth. So if we were to even take the whole climate change thing, right? Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, this whole cycling of carbon that I was talking about, the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are deeply impacted when you um, clear uh, what, you're, what you're calling as real forests or native forests and replace them with a commercial forest because the abilities and there was a very interesting paper where they compared how much carbon could be fixed by a plantation versus a what is called a nature forest. So the impact is huge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Vedant, if you have a follow-up question, we can take that for sure. Uh, Shayantini, um, so what are your thoughts on humans on an individual and collective level being open systems themselves and how that reality is reflected in systems like climate change? Yes. Uh, that's an interesting point, Shantani. Mm. So when we're talking about uh, being open systems themselves, um, so there are two ways of looking at it, right? One is thermodynamically looking at it as an uh, open system or a closed system. And the other way is to look at it socio-ecologically as well, right? Now, um, when you, I, I wanted some clarity from you on what you meant by open systems, right? Um, so I'm trying to understand the context in which you said open systems. Is it about the interrelationships between the individual and the collective? Are you referring to that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's what I meant. meant. Okay, 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 yeah. So, uh, you know, while the collective is critical at many levels, right? It's critical for decision making, it's critical for, responsing, er, for response, um, it's um, it's critical for for the way we uh, as citizens um, you know respond to uh, changes or we put pressure on governance the way we govern the way we uh, take on stewardship as opposed to ownership right so when we talk about the collective then there is this whole issue of the commons that comes in as well right we're talking about um, you know um, arriving at accommodations and negotiations in order to be able to uh, protect ecosystems or to be able to maintain integrity and balance of ecosystems, socio-ecological systems, right? So, so that is the strength of the collective um, and, and, and that's the interrelationship between them, right? But, uh, and how that reali reality is of reflected in systems, so in, in climate change, it's because um, there, there are, I mean, there's a lot of studies that have been done by psychologists on why, 
on how human beings are responding to climate change. You know, why is it that there's so much hesitation and why is there so much, um, what should I call it, uh, uh, sort of almost um, denial, right, in climate change. And, and also to think about it being somewhere out there, not, not in our lives. So um, the, the, the collective becomes very important in these cases because you also put pressure on each other, but you also dialogue around how you can create change. And change is, while individuals can create change to some extent, but the collective change and the collective pushing governance systems to change, that becomes very important in climate change. That becomes very important in taking action towards climate change because a lot of actions that, 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 are, respond, that are necessary to be taken for, you know, to mitigate global, global uh, you know, globally warming induced climate change are, are, while some of it is at an individual level, but a lot of it is political and policy changes that are required. A lot of it is market changes that are required, right? So I think this is where um, I'm hoping, Shantani, that um, you know some of some of your uh, some dimension of your question was sort of uh, discussed. It it has yeah. Thank you. Not at all. Um, not at all. Not at all. Not I am working on the psychological side of this. Oh, okay. How okay. people yeah. respond to climate yeah. change. So yeah. I will. Yeah. Yeah, most yeah. probably have a lot more questions for you over the. Sure, phone. sure, sure, sure. And also, um, I will send you the. There's a there's a really wonderful set of papers uh, available on on this on on climate change and, um, you know, Michael Hume has done some really really good work on that. So I I can send you the references. Well. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. No, oh, not at all. Yeah. Saranyu, how do we think or rethink about technological advancement or development <laughs> and ecological balance at the same time? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Now, when we talk about technological advancement or development, as you put it in, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in apostrophe, the thing is that um, what, I mean, I, uh, the way I see it is technological advancement, like these are all responses, right? The way we're responding to some change, right? So when we talk about development, first and foremost, it's you know it's the age-old question of development for whom, development for what, what is this development that we're talking about, right? And also to completely question, which of course a lot of people have been doing for a long time, is this idea of capitalism and 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 in and of course recently in the last at least last three months, I know there have been a whole bunch of papers challenging both from scientists as I mean, you know natural scientists as well as social scientists have always sort of uh, engaged in the in, in the debate, but. Uh, natural scientists, uh, you know, ecologists, physicists, chemists, etc., coming out with arguments and publications where uh, looking at this whole issue of the capitalist society. And there was one um, um, reference that I had sent as part of um, the three readings that I had suggested. And sorry, you should really look at that uh, paper from Nature. It completely uh, sort of uh, goes into very, very great detail about. Uh, the role of capitalism, affluent consumption, and how it's impacting uh, not just climate change, but zoonosis and the issue of the pandemic as well. Okay, to, so to sort of, uh, in a nutshell, to tell you, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about it on the third day, but in, 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 a, in a nutshell to sort of say that really at the heart of, you know, in this whole debate of, um, uh, of uh, ecological degradation, even way before we discussed climate change, uh, the whole issue of ecological degradation. Um, the big thing was about population. So there were all these theories about the population bomb, uh, you know, uh, that this was responsible for it was because of the developing countries which have high populations, which is why uh, nature is sort of stretched to its limits. And ecosystems are, uh, ecosystem balances are being, or ecological balances are being impacted. But when uh, increasingly, of course, We've all begun to understand that it is really, while population is an issue, it is about consumption, right? Okay. It's about, and, and who is consu consuming the most, right? There is, this, there is a whole section of society, whether it's in India or whether it is outside of India. Within India, it is sections of society who are cons where the consumption is way beyond any measure of requirement. And then globally, of course, we have large societies who are consuming way more than is required for them. And as a result of which, of course, there are other manifestations of overconsumption. So it's really uh, the, the, the argument uh, about, cap about capitalism is really about this push towards 
consumption and that to affluent consumption, right? So what affluent consumption is doing is, 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 is it's threefold. So one is that the affluent are consuming in a way which in itself is destroying uh, ecosystems and, and natural resources. Then they are also in positions of power and they're holders of capital, as a result of which they're driving the whole capitalist economy, which, in, which again is uh, the next stage. And then the third stage is, is by setting certain uh, so-called norms and aspirational standards or aspirational needs, right? They drive everybody else towards that level of consumption. So this is these are the three arguments that are being put forth in that paper. So I have a feeling, uh, Sarayu, you might really enjoy, um, you know, looking at that paper, and it might sort of give you even more uh, uh, points to think about. And as far as technological advance is concerned, um, you know, technology has always been touted as the as the panacea to all problems, right? It is the solution. However, uh, of, more often than not, we fail to see that technology is only part of the response. It's only part of what is called a solution. There are social responses, there are cultural responses, there are economic responses, there are political responses. And technological is just one part of that overall response. So unless we understand yeah, relationship and unless we understand um, all of these um, uh, you know, cycles and flows and uh, exchanges and interconnections that we were talking about earlier, we are going to constantly be um, you know, responding in this sort of myopic sort of way. Yeah, so that was Saryu. So Saryu, I think that's the beginning of another long conversation. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you. I'll check out the article that you shared. Yeah, please. Yeah, that'd be nice. And then we can talk a little bit more about it uh, tomorrow or day after as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we quickly, uh, I'm just going to read out some of the you know questions that have come on the uh, YouTube channel. Sure. We also have the live streaming going sure. on. Sure, sure, yeah. Sure. This is by Black Eyes and. Yeah. Uh, uh, according to this person, do indigenous systems, example, yes. North American Indians, Australian yes. Aboriginal, yes. uh, our own Indian forest dwellers, yes. have the concept of web of life? Uh, oh, yes. Great question, because you're going to see it tomorrow. I've actually taken an indigenous, uh, not tomorrow, day after, sorry. Uh, but then let me respond to you. Oh, absolutely. The web of life is at the heart of their understanding. And this is what I was going to come to uh, on, on the third day where we're talking about resilience is that, you know, uh, it's not new to human thinking. It's just that we have moved so far away from that understanding that uh, we have, we're now beginning to look at it differently. You know, it is not new to human thinking. Now, mainstream science or means or, or what we call industrial uh, education or mainstream science, we can call it either of the two. Is, is beginning to understand that. And then, of course, everybody's leaping towards indigenous communities now and saying, oh, we, we need to really, uh, they are our teachers. But the point is, uh, you know, there, there is a fundamental transformation that's required if you're looking at learning from indigenous communities. Oh, yes, web of life is very central to their existence, whether it is Adivasi communities, whether it is uh, the Latin American communities or, or aboriginals, all of the communities that you talked about. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, Naim, is there another one, or shall we look at Madhuri's? Uh, yeah, we can go to the other questions on, okay. in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So, Madhuri, what would be the probable impacts of increasing the amount of industrial and anthropogenic nitrogen fixation? Okay. So, that's a, that's an interesting question there. Um, so, the thing is that you know when the nitrogen balance changes, right? So you will invariably have more nitrogen uh, available in soil, right? And if there's more nat nitrogen available in the soil, then there is a washout of that nitrogen into water bodies and uh, leading to eutrophication, leading to uh, extensive uh, contamination of water bodies, which in turn impacts. Uh, and you've seen it in uh, and uh, you've seen it in all the uh, lakes and uh, you know ponds all over our cities where you have growth of um, plants, aquatic plants, you have growth of particularly things like water hyacinth, or you have these films of algae and uh, plant growth, which have grown as a result of this excessive nitrogen that has come from the fields, 
onto um, or come, come from soil onto into the water bodies. Now, as a result of which, the oxygen in the water bodies gets cut out. If the oxygen gets cut out, then you don't have, um, then, then it impacts other life forms in the water bodies. Yeah, and if it impacts other life forms, it are completely uh, affecting the entire uh, food web um, and uh, ecosystem there. So that's really uh, one of the examples of uh, what happens when the nitrogen balance gets impacted. There's also another example that's related to climate change. Uh, when we shift this uh, nitrogen balance, there is a release of uh, nitrogen uh, oxide, oxides of nitrogen, some of which are global warming gases. So Madhuri, there's a, there's a very strong interconnection here between the nitrogen and the carbon cycle. Yeah. Uh, we can come back to more questions, uh, Madhuri, if you have later. So then we have two questions from Shanta. Okay. How about the fact that we as a species have not yet discovered important yet subtle interactions like the fungi uh, trading energy and nutrients with the trees? Yes, the fungal bodies fetch the, fetching micronutrients and consuming the sugar from the roots. Many of these processes are only just being recognized. Very, very true. And uh, as a result of which, right, as a result of which, we, uh, we have to be so careful in how we engage with natural systems. We have to be so careful in how, because we don't know. We really don't know a lot, right? So, um, for example, in this particular case, if you were to indiscriminately fell trees, right? If you were to, uh, without, without this understanding, if you, if you were to clear forest, which is what is happening, and if you were to replant, right? This understanding will inform what you can clear and what you cannot. Because in the study, they found this relationship between the older trees and the younger trees and that you know in, in some situations the old because people were cutting down older trees for timber in some cases there was a communication between the older trees to the younger trees which actually regulated the hormonal development in the younger trees in such an interesting fashion that the younger trees did not they, their growth was retarded so they did not reach that maturity at which, which point they would be cut for timber cooks. So it was, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting evolutionary understanding as well. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this, this sort of understanding really also allows us to be so much more cognizant of what we are doing and, and also to, um, if, if we have to clear certain areas, how do you, you know, how, how do you think about this? How do you think about what trees to plant where? If you have an understanding of this kind, it, it, is, it, it can be, it can be such a, I mean, our, our interventions can be so much more meaningful. Our engagements can be so much more meaningful. Yes. Um, there's another question here. Ah, yeah. So I'll just finish with uh, Shanta. Are there any recently found interactions that will revise our understanding of ecology? Yeah, I mean, this tree one is a very important one. But also, you know, increasingly we are finding new species of uh, animals, whether it's amphibians or whether it is uh, reptiles or uh, whether it's butterflies, insects, whatever. So we are in increasingly uh, finding newer and newer species. We're also finding uh, modifications of newer and newer, I mean, modifications of existing species. And if you get into the microbial world, you know, we're beginning to understand so many more interactions. Like say, for example, this whole uh, thing, that, and I keep coming back to COVID-19 because it's so strong in our consciousness, right? But this whole uh, relationship that we uh, that we see here uh, of what is happening between um, microorganisms and uh, other animals, or the fact that you know when uh, animals live in close proximity with each other, what, what happens and how um, microorganisms are, are jumping from one host to the other. So these are all this, these are all understandings that we are gleaning uh, more and more recently as we experience more and more phenomena. Here is a comment come question on Facebook Live. Okay. Uh, this is by a friend called Sanjay Gadale. Okay. And according to him, what's all this confusion being created by vested interest is deliberately misinterpreting uh, AI to keep the issue in confusion as a process is compromised to mm -hmm. yield an assessment that is obviously flawed to meet the ends of a few vested interests. Mm -hmm. How do we handle this behavioral issue of extreme ignorance and arrogance? <laughs> that's a question that we all have to think about because that's 
That's, I mean, I, how do you handle it? I don't know. Really. It's about, see, first and foremost, um, the, the, the biggest problem is, of course, there's a certain arrogance that we have that we understand everything, yeah? That, that we understand natural systems, we understand um, how, uh, that, that uh, we are still, and, and of course, at the heart of this whole behavior is that we have control over nature. Now, for example, you take even our current approach, just overall, globally, to the pandemic. We're talking about the war against the pandemic. We're talking about, um, you know, uh, the, the vocabulary that is being used as well, right? The vocabulary that's being used is is, is a very uh, militaristic and 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 it's and this is a natural system. I mean, this is a virus, right? Without appreciating uh, the fact that uh, this virus has still has has sort of I mean, this is it's this tiny microscopic creature which has stopped life as we know it. Okay, so the, the the arrogance comes from the fact that you have completely alienated yourself from natural systems. I mean, that that's how I see it. And so, in order for that arrogance to be even, uh, you know, to, to be even addressed or responded to, uh, we I, I, we have to find ways by which we can re-establish that relationship. Which is why I, uh, which is why I strongly feel that it's at the level of education, that it's at the level of, like, for example, even with children, right? We have this whole uh, because of the society that they're growing up in. The disconnect between children and their surrounding environment is so strong that uh, even their vocabulary has changed. So um, it's a very, I mean, it's an existential question that you're asking, you know. So um, if, if there are other folks on the <laughs> discussion who have, uh, you know, other perspectives, it would be really uh, interesting. Uh, I mean, this is, I think, uh, yeah, so it's, it's from, it is at the heart of uh, what is happening in the world, really. So there is no straight answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's sort of what I was <laughs> arriving at. Yeah. yeah, that's true. But there it's a very very important point. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 There is another point to add more. Or or yeah, Ravi is saying yes. You can go. Yes, Ravi. Yes. I want to know that uh, what sort of measures can be taken so that the awareness yeah will be inculcated. Yeah. Uh, you are talking about at ground uh, level, even if there is no policy support from government right. or any other organization. Right, right, right. So there are. Um, so one is, of course, at the level of um, you know education. I mean, the, the only the only real way out there is through education. But when you're talking about education, I'm not talking about the formal school education. That too, that too has to be dealt with. But really, at a, a education at a very different level of the community, at the level of uh, you know, when we talk about education, we're always thinking about the formal education system, but really more at the level of dialoguing and uh, uh, at, at, at a community level, at the level of, um, you know, even even within families, um, to really begin to question and try and understand everything. I mean, something very simple, Ravi, it would be if you were to just look at your food, right? Where does my food come from? Even if you were to ask yourself that question and try and trace it back. Okay, if you were to do it as a family, it's fascinating what it reveals. And then it creates, a, because you begin to get, become sensitive to where your food is coming from, how it's being cultivated, how it comes to you. And we've all experienced it during the lockdown. We really have understood this, this, this whole crisis of food. So if you were to ask, if you were to do even something as small as this, you begin to appreciate um, and understand rather than uh, trying to understand it at an intellectual level. So Ravi, education is at many levels that we're talking about. Does that make sense? Does it, I mean, is it, um, is that something that um, you uh, you would uh, think about or um, if you had a follow-up on it? And while you are coming back to me, I look at some of the other questions. I think there's um, Devi right? I think. I um, what kind of social intervention is possible now to repair the system? We're encouraging people to plant trees, but will that solely help? Well, um, again, planting trees is uh, <laughs> a double-edged sword. <laughs> it's, a, it's really a double-edged sword because um, you have to, like, like we just talked about, like, we have to understand the relationship between uh, 
we have, to, we have to really understand more, which means we have to very actively engage in equipping ourselves with, with, with this kind of an understanding. But more so, when we talk about social intervention on repairing the system, I would say we need to first begin to even question. You know, I mean, we are not we are not even questioning even the simple question that I was just telling Ravi. Where does my food come from, right? How does water get to my taps? Right? We don't even uh, we, we're not even aware. So the, the first and even before we become aware, it's about observation. So are we even looking around to see what's happening around us, right? There's there's the observation of the senses, and then once you start observing, you become aware, and once you start becoming aware, you become sensitive, and then you take action. So it's, so it's really, when we talk about social intervention, it's not about somebody coming into a system and trying to create change, right? It's about the change happening within, which means the first step is to understand where I am, where am I? Where, how am I living my life, right? And when we do this collectively, and, and uh, you know, we've done this a lot with, with some of the groups, and, and one of the groups that, I've, that, I've, that I'm engaged in very deeply is the Kudali Intergenerational Center, where a lot of this kind of engagement through popular education is being done, where we, where, where, you, where you are, you are in your community, and you are raising these questions, and you're trying to understand where am I, you know, where am I in terms of how do I respond to my needs, where am I in terms of my food, where am I in terms of my shelter, my clothing, where am I in terms of my relationships with people, and then trying to understand that. So it's really it's a socio-ecological economic, so it's this whole interconnected thing, and to really look at it uh, as these, again, going back, set of relationships. So encouraging people to plant trees, yes, I mean, that's one action, right? But why do you, but then the question is, why do I want to plant trees? What should I plant? Where should I plant, right? So these are, uh, so, so it actually, um, it, it's not that straightforward an answer, unfortunately, like none of these answers are. <laughs> Um, Shantani, yes, um, sure, yeah, you can pick my brain, whatever there is of my brain, definitely. Yes, 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 definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if I'm allowed to ask, then I was just thinking, you know, most of the systems approach uh, tend to be, and there is no, you know, a quick fix or a fixed solution yeah. per se. Yeah. So, how do we get rid of this systems approach and get into uh, changing our situation rather than, you know, trying to find a, a solution? So. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, the thing is that, you know, first, in order to uh, I mean, again, finding a solution is very difficult because when you res when there is a change around you and you respond to that change, you have a new condition and you have to respond to that. So it's like this journey that you keep going on, right? But in order to even respond, Naim, you have to first understand the situation you're in, right? Okay, so like say, let, let's take this very, uh, I mean, I'm keep, I keep coming back to food because we're going to be looking at it tomorrow, right? So, uh, or even water. Okay, let's take even something like water, right? So if we don't understand how the water, how water gets to our house, right? When there is, and, and people are telling you, you have to conserve water, you have to conserve water. We tell our kids, you know, we tell everybody, conserve water, conserve water, you know, don't leave the tap open, et cetera, et cetera. Why? I don't even understand. You're telling me, so I'm doing it, but I'm not questioning that. I'm not, I'm not beginning to understand, you know, why is this such a big issue? Like say, for example, I live in Kerala. A lot of people, you know, Kerala gets so much rain and we have so much water, why, why should we even bother? Or I've had kids in school ask me this question, that if I can afford to pay my water bills, why should I conserve water? Right? But then we need to understand that it's from a larger pool that we are drawing this water. That if I don't do this, then somebody else is not getting that water. Right? So how am I linked to somebody else? So it's a it, there is so so there's this whole need so so this is how do we bring about this transformation? Now in order to bring about this transformation, we first have to become aware of where we are today, right? Without that awareness, it's very difficult because then it's cosmetic and we bring it in from the outside. Do you think that civilization has played a role in this, you know, equity and inequity, so called, you know, inequality and so on? Okay. So, yeah, how do we look at that, you know, equity, inequity and inequality? 
See, I mean, it's it's also about when we talk about inequity and inequality, it's 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 about the it's about how how the redistribution of resources, right? I mean, it fundamentally comes down to this whole issue of ownership and private property, and uh, you know, the idea of the idea of shared uh, access to resource, right? That understanding, okay, which existed, you know, which not that it didn't exist, of course it existed, but then we. Adopted an economic system, uh, or we sort of, and, and again, all these economic systems are all concepts of society. We adopted an economic system which is mainstream. I mean, there are still so many communities that don't do this. I mean, there are so many instances and examples of communities that live very differently. Right? But we have chosen to adopt this mainstream system of, uh, um, you know, uh, ownership or. Uh, Sort of how we engage with the resources and how we sort of uh, how we how we uh, our economic our socio-economic system we've chosen this particular system and so along with it comes all of this right or also the systems that have come over a period of time we have yes. experimenting like exactly, exactly. You talk about the resources yes uh, there is a political system which controls the distribution of the resources exactly it's about power right so are we, are we going to change the system and bring or replace a new system which is also going to be you know maybe less exploitative but there is going to be some kind of exploitation as such the thing is though why should there be one form of system for the entire world right why can't we have context specific systems that have evolved for a given Right? What works for one context, socio-ecological context, does not work for another one. Yeah. Right? So the question is, you, so, so that that's that's the larger question, isn't it? Yeah. You know, as a, as a, as 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 a human species, are we sort of ready to get onto that? And and there are there are there are societies, there are uh, situations where people are doing that, right? I mean, there are communities that are doing that. Where there are context, where where the where the exchanges, where the economic or the socio-economic systems have evolved for that particular context. So, do you find the very formative, you know, uh, you know, years of the human evolution had some problems yeah. of attracting the resources? So, there is some innate quality that they actually have. It's a it's also you know behavioral problem. Rather than just the socio-economic, political, or ecological problem as such. I mean, it, you're human beings, right? So when we say socio-economic, ecological, it's cultural. It is. It is the human. Um, you know, it's what we were just talking about earlier. Shantini and was saying about it's it's um, it's the psychology. It is. It is. It is emotional. It is cultural. It's social. It's all of it, right? And so it's very difficult to separate that because you get into this treadmill that that you sort of keep rolling along without looking at, without re-examining or examining or even bothering to sort of look at where you are. Right? And 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 then you know the destruction and, and then the sort of the conversation becomes abstract after that. So how do you ground it in reality? That's very important. And so the grounding in reality then comes from us examining ourselves. Us examining our food system, us examining the way we are building our houses, the way we are designing our cities, right? So, and 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 this is where social movements play a huge role. This is where uh, citizenry and uh, you know um, democratic approaches, uh, the freedom to, and it all comes back to all of the things that are increasingly being threatened, right? This is whether it's dissent or whether it's questioning. Right? So it really comes back to that of constant re-examination as a society, and unless that happens, <laughs> it's you know, is it? Yeah. There is one more in the chat box, I think. Okay. okay. Let me just look at that. Durga. Okay. Well, the question of networking of rivers is differing answers from science communities themselves. How do we resolve and take the ecologically viable solution? Absolutely. Yes. So this whole issue of networking of rivers, right? Yeah, that's a very, very contentious project, right? So um, it has, I mean, it, it's got huge ecological, it's got ecological, it's got social and economic implications. Now resolving it 
has to happen through. I mean, there are there are a lot of groups that have been exchanged that have been involved in this whole process of examining this project on networking of rivers, and uh, from an engineering perspective, from an ecological perspective, from a, from an economic perspective, arguments have been put forward. But um, it's not just that we want an ecologically viable solution. We also want, for want, I mean, you know, I hate using this word sustainable. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is, we want a solution, or we're looking at a response that is sustainable. That means it is ecologically, economically, socially, culturally viable. Okay, so that is important. Because we are no, we we are a socio-ecological system. You know, I mean, the planet is a socio-ecological system. So we have to look at balancing all of this, and it is a trade-off. So what is that trade-off, and where is that trade-off, and how is that trade-off different in different contexts? Right, the trade-off can be different in certain uh, locations. Like say, for example, if you are interlinking the Ganga with uh, some of its other tributaries, or if you are interlinking rivers in the south, the contexts are different, right? So, um, the, so, so therefore, the approaches have to be different. But interlinking rivers per se, okay, has a huge number of problems. It's a very superficial approach that is being adopted, which is that oh, because there is drought here, so we are bringing water. But that whole ecosystem has evolved. To those conditions, you know, by bringing water into a dry land area or a semi-arid area, you are actually going to completely change the local ecology, which is going to impact the social and socio-economic system and the cultural yeah. systems. Because the, because we don't place any value on different kinds yeah, of ecosystems, yeah. right? You have the desert yeah. ecosystem, yeah. you have the semi-arid, you have the tropical ecosystems. Each of them have their uniqueness, and each of them have life systems which have evolved there. Right? So we're only looking at abundance of water, and that's not necessarily an ecologically, socially, culturally viable solution at all. Okay. So, is it really possible to understand all the interconnections before we can take action? Is it required by the scientific method versus the intuitive understanding of indigenous communities requiring no proof? Yes, Durga. The thing is, most of us um, have evolved in this whole. Modern scientific educational system. So we're actually—I'm uh, not sure how many of us retain that intuition. A lot of indigenous communities, experiential knowledge, lived experience, has led to a certain understanding and a way of being with the surrounding environment, right? With their social systems and their cultural systems that evolved to that ecological system, and so that intuitive understanding and the accommodations. So they have also engaged in trade-offs. They have also engaged in accommodations and arrangements which allow them to exist and coexist with natural systems there. Okay, they are very very sophisticated uh, systems have been put in place, right? But for us, the problem is that we have alienated ourselves so much that um, I'm afraid that we are that intuitive sense is completely gone out of the window. So we need to. I mean, the question is: all the interconnections is an is an interesting point because at least we need to begin to understand and appreciate that there are interconnections, so that any action you take, you know that there is a consequence to that action. You don't respond by saying this is the end. Like you don't say that if I if I uh, build if I if I plant trees here, then I am going to address climate change. You know. Afforestation is one way to address climate change. You don't do that. You you know that afforestation is part of a series and a and and a complex set of measures, which is a response to climate change. So that's what I mean by interconnections. Yeah, because it can paralyze you. If you if, if, sometimes it can paralyze decision making if you think, oh my God, I need to understand everything before I take it. So like even for example, the choice of you know clothes we wear or the food we eat. If you have some sense of where it's coming from, you may make a different choice. Okay, you may choose to eat something else. You may choose to eat something more local than something that's imported. If you know that it's imported, but if you don't know, right? So that's that's what I mean by you know knowing and understanding something.
thank you radha this is durga yeah durga yes yes yeah, yeah. my main question is you know there is generally a long answer yeah uh, because there is a, there are so many connections that have to be thought about Correct. versus there are the short term people who come up with uh, quick fixes <laughs> yes. and uh, the, therefore you know it's a losing battle yeah. and you very correct you know very uh, i mean it's very good to hear that there is something called trade off and therefore yes uh, once there is trade off you know the, uh, the always there is a losing side right yes. because yes. the economic yes. is play a role yes. and so on exactly. so exactly 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 yes thank you not at all thank you thank you for that yeah It reminds me of Polavaram Dam. I know. Yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. It does. It's linking of South Indian rivers, the big mighty Godavari with Krishna. Yes. Yes. This is the absurd idea of you know connecting rivers must be you know dating back to the Britishers. So one engineer uh, in the British you know colonial era thought of you know linking river, and that's how they uh, you know unearth the documentation. Yeah. But also, we have, uh, you know, we are no better, right? I mean, uh, we have a colonial legacy, and then we built on it rapidly and very uh, aggressively too. Uh, yeah. So, if there are no questions, I think we can all call it a night. Uh, yeah. There is so much food for thought, so we can all <laughs> chew. Uh, we can yeah. chew and churn for tomorrow's session. Sure. Uh, sure. That's going to be our food web, uh, and yeah. please do the. you know the links which are there in the description of the event and that is going to really help you to understand the food it will be good actually and also thank you so much all of you i mean this was a some such in terrific um, you know sort of thoughts for discussion i wouldn't call them questions it's really all of us sharing our own concerns and uh, you know so thank you for making this uh, very alive for me as well so that's lovely yeah. thanks i look forward to tomorrow's conversation yeah yeah, yeah. So, no it boils down to us at the end no exactly in the, at the end exactly exactly right like, yeah so yeah uh, thank you so thank much you. for the no, very one thank you thank you patiently answering all the queries oh no no not at all yeah <laughs> makes one think so much right <laughs>